So here we're going to introduce the idea of price controls. So what is going to happen here is we've seen that, okay, if a free market, if left to itself, given our assumptions, right, where we have lots of homogenous consumers, lots of homogenous producers, if all of these many, many consumers and producers were left to themselves, we would achieve an allocatively efficient outcome all on our own, right? Just market forces would push us to this allocatively efficient outcome. Here we will explore what happens if the government decides to impose price controls on this market. We will analyze the impact of this, uh, the impact on efficiency, on surplus using our welfare analysis, so consumer surplus, producer surplus, and social surplus. So an example is kind of the thing we're going to be taking a look at is, let's say, the market for rentals. So you want rent for your shelter, right? You need a house or an apartment to rent. And let's say to start off that this is determined entirely by market forces. Supply, demand, you're at equilibrium. However, we have a problem. We feel that the current price of rent, the current cost of rent is too high. And so we want to force it lower. So the government puts in some kind of price control. We'll see what that takes a look at. Puts in a price control to force rent low. Well, think about this for a second. If it forces the price of rent low, that's changing our round with our willingness to pay, our willingness to accept the quantity exchanged. How would this impact the welfare of society? Is society's welfare going to be greater? Is it going to be less? Are we still going to have an efficient outcome? Right? So these are the big things we're going to take a look at as we move through this video is this idea of price controls on efficiencies. Uh, the one thing I really want to keep in mind with this is that we are analyzing a market that has lots of consumers, lots of producers, such that all of these consumers and producers are tiny, right? They have very little influence on the market altogether. This is important because, right, Econ 103, most of you, this is the only economics course you'll have. You're getting just enough information to be dangerous, you quite often see the cases that come up here being used in the news, in the media, in politics to make a case that, hey, these price controls we're about to introduce are always bad. Well, okay, they're bad, then we'll show, right? Oh, there we go, ruin the surprise. These price controls are bad if those initial assumptions are met, that we have lots of suppliers, lots of consumers, and they're all small. If that's not met, if the market's not able to be allocatively efficient on its own, well, then sometimes we can make a case for these price controls to be put into place. And ideally, that's what needs to happen. There's kind of a Murphy's Law of Economic Policy, though, unfortunately. This is uh, often credited to Alan Binder. He stated that economists have the least influence on policy where they know the most and are the most agreed. The flip coin of that is that we have the most influence on policy where we know the least and in which we disagree about the most vehemently, right? And so many of these price controls, economists are typically very, very agreed upon the outcomes of this. We know a lot about these and we have a pretty strong view as to when they work, when they don't work. Unfortunately, these price controls typically fall into the political realm. Economists have very, very little influence over them. The flip side, other policies that are new, cutting edge, there's a lot of disagreement. We're not quite too sure about the impacts of all of them. These tend to be areas that we do get to put influence on. And it's this whole like Murphy's Law of Economics. Like the stuff we know the most about, we can't influence. And the stuff we know nothing about, somehow we end up influencing. So that aside, what are we covering? What are our objectives for this video? So our objectives, two things. First, we're going to determine the price and quantity exchanged under price controls and taxes. So we're going to introduce this taxation and what the impact of that is as well. We will also, our second objective is to identify and compute the impacts of price controls on the welfare of society. So first, putting in the price control, identifying what our quantity exchange and our price is. I should say identifying and computing quantity exchange and price. Second objective, analyzing the impacts this has on welfare. So our surplus analysis. Okay, let's get started. Let's take a look at this. So to start off, again, already went through this, but just to really nail this in, our fundamental assumptions for this model. Our fundamental assumptions, right? And these are our assumptions for our supply and demand model. So we've gone through this, what, four times now? that we have 
lots of small homogeneous firms and consumers. And right again, what this means about having lots of small homogeneous firms and consumers, no one firm, no one consumer has a great influence over the market, right? Every individual firm, every individual consumer is a drop in the bucket is insignificant with respect to the size of the market on whole. That is, both firms and producers, sorry, both firms and consumers are simply price takers. They just witness that market price from supply equals demand equilibrium. They take that. They have no ability to influence it. This is actually a pretty important assumption. And I'm sure you can look at the world around you and look at cases, look at markets where this assumption is violated. We'll get to those situations later in the course. But keep in mind right now, we're introducing price controls underneath this assumption. So something to keep in mind. Okay. Then, second bit to kind of keep in mind to look at is the determination of price. So, okay, this was our entire last few videos was our determination of price. And that is, hey, in a free market, if this is assumption is true, how is price determined? And let's suppose this is the price for rentals, right, for housing rentals. Well, in a free market, with these assumptions being true, the price of a rental is going to be determined by the demand for rentals in conjunction with the supply of rentals. Now, these two together, these two together will yield a market price as well as a market quantity exchange, right? How many rooms are available for rent and the price per room is one way we could look at this. Perhaps, right, instead, quantity is how many square feet are available for rent and the price per square foot. Depending on how we wanted to define this, we could think about it in different ways. But, ah, that's kind of, that's kind of the aside. If we take a look at this right now in the Capital Regional District, last I looked at least, the average rent for a one-bedroom is $1,000. So $1,000 Canadian to rent a one-bedroom apartment, house, whatever that might be, on average within the Capital Regional District. Okay, so problem. This is what the current market price is. However, many people would argue that this is mismatch, that incomes don't support this, that this price is way too high. Well, you have to kind of keep in mind how prices are determined. These prices are determined by the allocatively efficient outcome, supply equals demand, if this is true. And that is, this is what the price ought to be. We actually get the most amount of welfare as a society, the most amount of surplus benefit as a society at this point. If we deviate from this point, our total welfare, our total surplus, our total benefit that we receive as a society will actually fall. So that is, if we want to make the argument that there's a mismatch between the economic price and what would be maybe a socially optimal um, price from, say, maybe a political view or a social view of right and wrong, well, we need to then argue what that price should be, where that price should be instead. And the problem is, well, where is it? Where do we pick? And once we pick a value, how do we enforce it, right? And would it be good to make this subjective other point as to where prices should be? And would it be good to enforce this? So we actually have some pretty big questions to ask. If we feel and we have a strong case that, hey, this current economic price of rent is way too high. Yeah, that's what supply and demand are telling us. But socially, this doesn't align with our values. Right, from a social perspective, we believe that rents should be lower. Well, okay, if that's the case, if we believe that rents should be lower from our social perspective, what ought they to be? Aha, that becomes the issue, right? And that becomes a political issue, not something we're really going to get into here. So we're going to presume that politics, right, that they have come out and they have decided what the price of rent ought to be at most. So here we're looking at the price of a rental for a single bedroom, and we said, hey, price is 1000 Let's suppose that the government comes along and they say that the maximum price for a 
one bedroom is only 800. So what they've come is they've come along and they have imposed what we'll call a price ceiling saying that, okay, we are only allowed to have prices for one bedroom rentals up to $800. If you want to charge less than $800, that's fine. You can charge whatever you want less, but you are not allowed to charge more. That is, this is the ceiling. This is the maximum possible price that we could witness. And this is legislated, right? This is law. If you are found breaking this, you are found in violation of the law, and now there's legal penalties that you'll face. Maybe depending on the severity of this, this is jail time. Maybe it's fines. Maybe it's a slap on the wrist. Who knows what it is? That would all be in the legal terms as to what's happening, right? You have to keep in mind that economics is kind of two parts. In economics, we are studying how agents, the players, aim to win the game, right? They are trying to win the game. They're trying to get the most utility, the most profit they can so that they can finish the game as winners. Politics, the legal side, that changes the rules of the game. So, okay, in economics, all we're going to do is say, okay, we have this new set of rules. How do our players adapt? How do our players re-optimize in order to get the highest utility, the highest profit they can given these new rules? So a little bit of a situation going on here. You're a player. How do you change the way you play the game given a change in the rules? So our new rule, price ceiling, maximum possible price. So in this case here, this new maximum possible price is at 800. So, okay, we have this new maximum price of 800 and we witness, so, oh, but the market wanted to charge 1,000. That is, we would actually call this a binding price ceiling. That's because the market's actually bound by it, right? The market wants to charge a price up here, but the government says, no, 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 this is the maximum. So what happens? If we are, if it's illegal to charge higher than this, well, we are now bounded at a point such that supply to the price ceiling, this is going to be my quantity supplied, demand at my price ceiling, well, this is going to be my quantity demanded. So we have a lot of units being demanded. A lot of landlords are saying, well, no, at 800, I don't want to supply my unit. That's not worthwhile. That's not a good investment for me. I'm just going to live in it or sell it. It's not worth it for me to actually rent it out. And so the result of this is that we get all of this as excess demand. Okay. The situation is, though, is that, hey, if we had a functioning market, if we didn't have this price control in place, we'd have this excess demand. The demanders would begin to bid up the price of rentals. They say, hey, I really need somewhere to live. I really want to pay more just so I can guarantee a place to live. And they begin to bid it up till we got to 1000 The problem is, is that the government's put in this law. They've said, hey, great, even though some of you consumers would be willing to pay more than 800 to guarantee a place to live, we're not going to allow it. We're going to make it illegal in the idea of fairness. And so in this case here, you cannot bid up the price. The landlords cannot accept the price greater than 800. And so we are just stuck in this situation of excess demand. So, okay, we're stuck in this situation of excess demand. We have this bit of a discrepancy then, right? We have our quantity demanded here. We have our quantity supplied here. Keep in mind what our actual quantity exchanged is. Well, the quantity exchanged is the lesser of the two. So the lesser of the two then, well, that's my quantity supplied. So that guy there, that becomes my quantity exchanged. What, what happens? Well, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Are we better off? Are we worse off as a result of this? Well, okay. If you are a tenant, if you could secure a place to live, it seems like you're better off, right? That is, if you are part of, if you are part of these guys here on our supply curve up to QS, right? If you part of this quantity supplied, if you were able to secure yourself a rental here, 
yeah, you're you're happy, right? You are able to get it at 800 versus 1,000. The problem is, what about all of these people? What about everybody who used to be able to get a rental between quantity supplied and the initial equilibrium? They're now all evicted as the landlord decides to sell their place or stop offering it as a rental. They're hooped. There's now even fewer rentals available to them. Similarly, we have all of these people who are now moving to the area or now wanting to rent because, hey, rent's cheap. Well, again, they can't find a rental either. So we get all of these people in excess demand that are now homeless. Now they cannot even find a rental, even if they could afford to pay more. They're now displaced. They now have no access at all to the market. So problematic, right? We now have a vacancy rate of near zero. As soon as a place pops on the market, it's taken up and people are fighting to get access to it. So problems, problems. Um, on top of all this, well, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the welfare analysis first. Let's see what happens with the welfare analysis. So like we said, the quantity supplied, the lower of the two is our new quantity exchanged. So let's take that and let's draw just a line straight up. Okay. So there's our line straight up. Let's identify then our producer and our consumer surplus. So starting off with the producer surplus. Initially, at the initial equilibrium, we had everything below 1,000 all the way along the supply line. So if I just wanted to highlight that, we would have had all of this initially as producer surplus. However, Underneath the price floor, I now have below my legislated price up to the quantity supplied, the quantity exchanged, above my willingness to accept. So that is underneath the price ceiling, the price control, I now only get this as my producer surplus. So you can see our producer surplus is significantly smaller as to what it would have been at equilibrium. Okay, so that's the producer side. What about the consumers? What about the consumers? Well, initially the consumers were earning below their willingness to pay all the way up to the initial quantity exchange above the price they had to pay. Okay, and then all the way up. So that was initially our producer surplus. Then we have the price ceiling getting put into place. Underneath the price ceiling, we have below our willingness to pay, up to our new quantity exchanged, all the way down to the new price ceiling price. So that is underneath the price ceiling, we are going to have all of this as consumer surplus. So we see, right, we see in this case here that the consumers, they win, they get a little bit of a plus, but they also lose some as well, right? If we take a look at that, if we take a look at what I mean by that, is that the producer, now oh, let's use blue for that, sorry. The producer gained this box here from the, con from, sorry, the consumer gained this box from the producer. This used to be part of the producer surplus, the consumer has gained it. They have captured this due to this legislation. What has also happened though, what has also happened is that the consumer has lost this triangle over here, right? This is a negative. They have lost that and they have gained this. So, okay, they have a trade-off here. If this is bigger than that, well, then our consumer will be altogether better off. The producer, we see that they've all together lost, but we see as well this little bit over here, let's use yellow again for the loss. We see that our producer has also lost this little bit of the triangle. So in this sense here, as we work out our social surplus, well, we get our social surplus to be producer plus consumer. So our social surplus would be this entire bit, all the way up here, all the way, let's make this a little bit easier to see. Right, all of this guy here, 
all the way up above my willingness to accept. All right, this is just the red and the blue put together for my social surplus. So all of this would be my social surplus, but if we look at it in relation to what it would have been without this price control, without this price ceiling, we witness that we have lost this area here, this yellow area. This is just lost to society, right? This is now no longer reaped, this is no longer had. This is what we would refer to as society's dead weight loss. This is just a loss to us because of this government intervention, because of this government imposing a price ceiling on the market. And what we see, right, if we actually work this out, society overall is worse off. Producers, producers are definitely the losers, right? Producers have definitely lost. We can't even argue with that. Their surplus used to be quite a bit larger. It's now gotten smaller. Consumers, consumers have likely won. They've gained this box. They've lost that little triangle, but right? Lost this little triangle here, gained this box here. Likely this box is bigger, so likely consumers are our winners here. Producers, boo, they're worse off. Consumers, yay, they're better off. Society altogether, society overall, boo, society overall is actually worse off, right? We've had now this deadweight loss, with this deadweight loss, our total social surplus is down. So government getting involved in an allocatively efficient market, imposing a price control such as a price ceiling, has the effect of lowering altogether surplus and thus creating an inefficient situation. Right? If we wanted to kind of show that this was inefficient, again, we said that allocative efficiency was when price equals marginal cost or marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Well, we see, okay, at our quantity exchanged, right? And this is, of course, at our quantity exchanged. So at our quantity exchanged, we have right here, the first line we're hitting. That's my marginal cost. Quantity supply, that's my quantity exchanged all the way up to my demand curve. Well, that there. That's going to give me my price or my marginal benefit. Well, sorry, not my price because my price is set at the price ceiling. So that's going to be my marginal benefit. And so we see that marginal cost does not equal marginal benefit. And thus, we are not allocatively efficient. We have lost out on surplus. We are artificially holding our quantity exchanged our amount of rentals, we are artificially holding it down. Okay, beyond this, beyond this kind of what we can calculate as our social surplus, as our kind of social welfare, social well-being, we actually have other problems that go along with price ceilings as well. We have other kind of social effects that we end up witnessing. And there's four kind of social costs. And let's take a look at these guys. Okay, so these social costs. What are they? First, because we have, right, and we saw this here, because we have all this excess demand and we cannot bid up the price because of government legislation, we have goods being sold and along the lines of seller's preference. And so what's meant by seller's preference is essentially discrimination, is that the seller, the producer, in our case that we're looking at, the landlord, just gets to choose who they're going to give it to, and who they're not going to give it to. We actually see this in markets with heavy, heavy rent control, where, hey, the rent control is holding prices really low. With the price being held really low, we see rampant discrimination. I'm not going to rent to you because you're a student. I'm not going to rent to you because you're too young. You're too old. You're of this ethnicity. You're of this religion. You're of this gender, right? In these cases here, this is outright discrimination. It is illegal. But there's ways that landlords can kind of weasel around that and just lease their place, rent their place, sell their good or service to those people who kind of fit what they want to fit. So this is a problem, right? This is a problem. The next social cost is, well, it could just be sold on a first come, first serve basis. 
that is the result of this is we get lineups, right? You start to spend a lot of your day, right? This carries an opportunity cost. This is an opportunity cost of time. You start to spend a lot of your day lining up just to get this good that you need, right? Because, hey, if you're first in the line, you get bread today. If you're first in the line, you get gas. If you're first one to respond to that ad, you get the rental. First come, first serve. The problem is with this is that instead of working, instead of being productive, you're now just queuing. You're now just searching for ads for a new rental. You're just waiting in line for food. You're just waiting in line for gasoline. The problem that all this causes is just an inefficiency in the fact that you now have this huge opportunity cost of your time. And that could be time better spent in other places. Third case that could happen. Third case is that we can witness the rise of black markets. So, okay, with black markets, this is essentially an illegal market. So not the government sanctioned market. This is now outside of that. And now individuals start to hoard goods and services and sell them illegally. Sell them under the table, sell them in like the back alleyway, sell them outside of the prying eyes of the government. So how exactly does this work? Well, one of the big reasons why we would put in a price ceiling is because we want to keep prices, right? We want to keep prices low because we have this idea of uh, we want equitable consumption. That is, we have this belief that everybody should have access to this. It should be set at a price that everybody should be able to afford it so that there's equity or at least the availability of equity in consumption. But here's the problem. Let's go back and look at our graph here. Let's suppose that a black market forms and you were to have our quantity exchanged here, so QS, and let's take a look. We have a few different prices that we could, if we could hoard this to ourselves and resell it, we have a few different options as to what price we sell this at. So if we were to hoard this good and resell it, we could, well, we could choose to quantity supplied. We could sell this at the market price or sorry, the government legislated price of 800. Well, okay. Yeah, we could, but uh, that's not really the best if I'm a black marketer. I can sell it for more. I'm evading the government laws. So I could go up and sell it for the original market price, a thousand. Yeah, sure, but what's so special about this point? I mean, honestly, if this is my quantity exchanged, why not take it all the way up, all the way up to this point here, right? This here is my maximum willingness to pay, if this is what the suckers are willing to pay for this quantity supplied, well then yeah, I'm going to charge them for this quantity supplied all the way up to their maximum willingness to pay, and I will charge them out here. So we can call this point here right where their marginal benefit would be, this would be our black market price. That is Okay, we put in a price ceiling to have equitable consumption so that everybody could afford it because we thought $1,000 was too much. If black markets are then allowed to form, well, we can witness black market prices far succeeding, right? Far way above the initial market price. Meaning that if we couldn't control the black markets, the whole point of putting in this policy ends up failing. We can even witness higher prices than we ever had before. So black markets can form in this case here. Final one, our final kind of cost, social cost of a price ceiling. This final social cost is rationing. Right, and rationing is a further measure that the government puts into place in order to try to control these guys. Right, so in rationing, in order to buy the good, you need two things. You need enough money to be able to afford the price ceiling price, and you need some kind of ticket, right? And I say ticket, but ultimately it's some criteria that you meet. And in that case there, rationing overcomes seller's preference. The can't really discriminate against you because, hey, if you have a ticket and you have the money, you have a right to buy the good. You don't need to line up. You don't need to wait in lines. You don't need to deal with first come, first serve because, again, if you have the ticket, 
and you have the money, there is a good for you. Finally, it helps destroy black markets because A, people can't stockpile this good to resell at a high price, and B, well, again, if you have a ticket, you can get the good. So rationing helps to overcome this. The problem is, is that rationing doesn't always come out in kind of a fair way, right? If they were to put out, say, hey, you get one loaf of bread per household, well, for single person households, maybe that's great. For a family of five, family of six, a single, sli a single um, loaf of bread is not going to go very far. So rationing doesn't always work out perfectly for everybody. Farther, we typically tend to kind of react negatively against rationing. I don't know if anybody remembers, but back in March 2020, many goods began to be rationed, right? We have this, it wasn't necessarily a government legislated price ceiling, but prices weren't adjusting upwards fast enough. So we were selling out of everything. Different companies, different grocery stores were imposing rationing on their goods, saying, no, 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 you can only buy one thing of toilet paper. You can only buy so much meat. You can only buy so much cereal. You can only buy so much rice. But but I own a business. I need to buy more rice. Sorry, only one bag of rice per person per visit, right? So all of this kind of becomes more difficult to transact, more difficult to do business, making it problematic for us. So as we went through all that, rice ceilings, other problematic, we're artificially holding the price too low. We have excess demand as we try to fight each other to get those limited goods that are available. We get kind of nasty. And as we get nasty, we have these social costs. So price ceilings, why do we put them in? To try to get equitable consumption. Costs of them, lower social welfare, discrimination, lineups, black markets, and government rationing. So lots of costs in putting these into place. So clearly we don't use these, right? No, no, these are actually quite, quite dominant in our society. These show up a lot, right? The one example we used already was rent control. Rent control is a price ceiling. It is artificially holding the price low. And we do see, if we start to think about it, lower surplus, and we do see these happening. Government doesn't necessarily come into ration, but we do see the first three happening. We see discrimination in rental markets. We see long lineups in order to get a rental. And we see black markets forming. We see illegal suites that aren't declared. We see extra charge for parking. We see extra charge for keys. All of these little things to kind of help to push your rent up to a black market price. So we see these things occurring in rent controlled markets for sure. Okay, so that's, that's our first case of a price ceiling. Again, this would be a case of a binding price ceiling. And let's take a look at an example as to why I call this a binding price ceiling. Let's look at another case. So we have our price, we have our quantity. Uh, we'll have our demand curve and we'll have our supply curve. So there's supply, demand, and we'll have our initial market price as such. And let's say that this is 500 and some quantity exchanged. In this case, the government puts in a price ceiling of, um, let's say they put in a price ceiling of $900. Okay, cool. So they go and do that. There's my price ceiling. Price ceiling at 900. Keep in mind, price ceiling is maximum allowable price. Sure, you can charge whatever you want less than this, but you cannot charge more than 900. Well, okay, cool, can't charge more than 900. Market doesn't wanna charge more than 900. So, sure, we have a price ceiling, government's legislated this, but we would say that this is non-binding, right? The market is not bound by it. It's there, it's law, it's legally written, 
but the market doesn't care because the market wants to charge a lower price anyways. So non-binding price ceiling, one that's set above the market price. So we have these cases happening as well. Not very interesting. It doesn't do anything, right? It has no impact at all. Another scenario, right? Another scenario is kind of the opposite. And in our other scenario, we could have a, what is known as a price floor. And in the case of a price floor, this is where the government sets a minimum price, right? So the opposite of a price ceiling. Price ceiling was saying, hey, this is the legal maximum price. You're not allowed to charge any more than this. For a price floor, this is the legal minimum price. It is illegal to pay less than X many dollars for this good or service. So examples of this, right? Why would the government legislate a minimum price? Well, what's an example of a minimum price? Minimum wage, right? Minimum wage is a minimum price. And so let's take a look at what's going on. We have our market. We have price. We have quantity. We have our demand curve downward sloping, and we have our supply curve going on up. So supply, demand. We then have our equilibrium price and quantity. So there's my equilibrium price. There's my equilibrium quantity. And let's say that at equilibrium, we have something like 10. And then there's my equilibrium quantity, however many hours of labor are being supplied. Right, this here would be my market for labor. We're getting paid $10 per hour, and Q would be number of hours being exchanged altogether. In this case here, right, if we're talking about the labor market, demand is firms, companies, how many hours of labor being demanded by them, and supply, that's you and I supplying our labor to the firms, to the producers in this case. So it's a little bit of a backward sync from how we think of most goods and services. At this case here, right, we could work out, okay, our producer and our consumer surplus, consumer surplus, this initial triangle, producer surplus, this initial triangle. So, okay, produ sorry, producers, consumers, what they're getting in each case is surplus. And then let's suppose we impose a minimum wage. So a minimum price saying, hey, hey, this must be the lowest that is possible to pay somebody per hour. So we impose this. We say, here we go. We have a new minimum wage of $15 an hour. And at this new minimum price of $15 an hour, well, we see that the market's bound by this, right? This is our binding, binding price floor. Market wants to charge 10. We're saying, no, 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 we're going to set this law. It's illegal to pay any less than 15 for labor. So what ends up happening? Well, at this, we get our quantity demanded. We get our quantity supplied. So, okay, quantity demanded quantity supplied such that we have all of this excess supply and again keep in mind the lesser of the two becomes my quantity exchanged so okay we impose this minimum wage good bad what ends up happening well let's take a look right as we get this higher wage the firms those in those uh, companies that are hiring people to work for them they go, well, wow, at this higher wage, I don't want as many workers anymore. So our quantity demanded falls. So good, bad, well, all of these people who were working and were happy to work at $10 an hour, they all got laid off, right? They got laid off such that we now only have this many people working. Additionally, at this higher wage, right, this higher kind of compensation for entering the workforce, keep in mind you have costs to enter the workforce. You have costs of your work clothing, transportation, maybe childcare, extra food costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So at a higher rate of compensation, higher wage, 
This is enticing more people to enter the workforce, but all these extra people entering the workforce can't find work. So what we end up with was all of this excess supply or unemployment. Right, and then all of this unemployment, well, now these are all people who are wanting jobs, looking for jobs at $15 an hour, but unable to find it. Particularly the big problem, the big problem is these people who used to have jobs who were laid off because the firms can no longer afford to pay as many people at this higher rate. Okay, surplus analysis. What ends up happening? We had our initial surplus, blue triangle, red triangle. Where do we end up at now? Well, following this, let's start off with our consumer. So below our demand, up until our new quantity exchanged above our new price. So we see that the firm, the consumer of labor, we see that their surplus falls. All right, so this is now our consumer surplus. Significantly lower, right? What have they lost? They've lost this triangle. They've lost that rectangle. On the other side, what has happened to the producer, right? The supplier of labor, you and I in this case. Well, in this case here, above our willingness to accept, all the way to the quantity exchanged, all the way below this price floor. So in this case here, we're getting all of this now. We've captured this rectangle from the consumer. And we have our new producer surplus. In the end, the last bit, these two triangles here that used to be part producer, part consumer surplus, these are now lost altogether. And again, these two triangles together, these are referred to as the dead weight loss. This was surplus, this was net benefit that society used to be able to have access to, but they no longer do, right? This has been lost to them due to the imposition of this new legislation, this new price floor. So we're worse off in this case here. What are some extra, extra kind of social costs, right? In the case of our price ceiling, we'll have to do four extra social costs. Well, in the case of a price floor, we don't have all these extra social costs. Really the big one is that we just kind of have all this excess supply. So right in our agricultural markets, our agricultural markets often have things like price floors put into place. We just end up hoarding or storing this. We often justify this as food security. In labor markets, another one where we have minimum wages put into place, well, we have unemployment. We have higher rates of unemployment in these markets. So that would be kind of our additional impacts or additional social costs of implementing these, despite the loss of efficiency and the loss of welfare. So price floors, price ceilings, let's take a look now. We've taken a look at them just kind of generically identified where they go and the impacts they have. Well, let's take a look at them numerically. Let's compute the impacts of these. So let's start off with the following supply and demand. Price is 110 minus 2Q. Price is 10 plus 3Q. And then just to make our lives a little bit easier, I'm just going to solve this for us to start off. I'm just going to say that, hey, our equilibrium, we'll call that P prime, equilibrium price is going to be $70 a unit. And our equilibrium quantity exchanged is going to be 20 units. So there we go. We get that to start off. Let's graph this. Price, quantity. What do we have? Well, oh, let's use the right tool for that, make a nice straight line. I'm gonna have my demand. My demand is running from 110 down to 55. And then I'm gonna have my supply starting at 10, a little bit steeper, 
and running up as such. So there's my supply, there's my demand. Equilibrium price and quantity to start off. There's my price, there's my quantity. What did I say this was? 70 and 20. Okay, so to start off with, let's go and impose a, well actually before we even impose anything, let's go and work out what my initial welfare is, right? What's my initial consumer, producer, and social surplus? That way that we kind of have a baseline to compare it to. So, okay, consumer surplus, I'll call this consumer surplus not, because it's my initial. Well, that's going to be one half base times height. So one half base of 20, height of what? 70 minus 110, so it's going to be 40. Uh, we can get rid of that. So 70, one half, 20 times 40. So that's going to yield for me a total consumer surplus of 400. I'm then going to have my producer surplus initially. One half, same base of 20, height now of 70 minus 10. 60. So what does that give me? One half 20 times 60 is going to be a producer surplus of 600. Adding the two up will give me my social surplus, and that is a thousand dollars is my social surplus to start. Great. Let's go and let's put in a the government comes along. And they put in a price floor, so right, guaranteed minimum price of $80. We need to go and now conduct a welfare analysis. We need to find out who are the winners of this policy, who are the losers of this policy, and what has happened to our surplus in each case. So let's go take a look at that. So price floor of 80, let's draw that. This is 70, so something like that. That can be my 80 price floor. Carrying down, I'm going to have my quantity demanded, and I'm going to have my quantity supplied. So, okay, I know my price. That is 80. Turns out, unless I need to know how much excess supply that I have, I don't actually need to know what this is to answer this question. All I need to know is my quantity exchanged because everything's based off of that. And if we look at this graph, we should have an idea that my new quantity exchange is less than 20. So, okay, cool. How do I go about determining my new quantity exchanged? Well, keep in mind, this value here is my quantity demanded. We went 80 to the demand curve down, this guy's my quantity supplied, this guy's my quantity demanded, quantity demanded, let's use our demand function. So price equals 110 minus two quantity demanded. Plugging in what we know, price of 80. So 80 equals 110 minus two quantity. Start going through, again, I don't like negative, so let's add 2Q to both sides. 80 plus 2Q equals 110. Get the Q by itself, so minus 80 from both sides, so 110 minus 80. I get 2Q equals 30. Finally, divide both sides by 2 to get the Q by itself. Q equals 15. So I get my new quantity exchange to be 15. Now, well, I can begin to start working out my updated consumer and producer surplus. So let's start off with the let's start off with the consumer surplus. So for the consumer surplus, what am I looking for? Below my demand curve, above my new price floor. So this guy right here, my new updated consumer surplus that I need to find. So okay, we can work that out. That's going to be one half 
my new base of 15 times my new height, 110 minus 80 of 30. So that's going to give me a new consumer surplus, consumer surplus 1 of 225. So, okay, we can see with that our consumer has definitely lost. Our consumer is the loser in this case here. What about, what about the producer? What's happening for the producer? Well, our producer is above our willingness to accept all the way up to this price floor. And we find that we get this weird kind of shape. This seems problematic, right? We don't really know how to solve for this kind of shape. We don't have some nice kind of function to say, hey, you just do this and we get the area of this weird shape. But luckily for us, what we can do is we can realize that, hey, if I take this right here, that is 15 up to my supply curve, or that is my marginal cost, minimum willingness to accept curve. If I take 15 up to there, I could solve for that marginal cost that minimum willingness to accept. And once solved for this value, I just have a rectangle and a triangle. And I can solve for this triangle and this rectangle individually. I can add them together and I can find out this total shape. So let's do that. So I wanna put in my quantity supplied of 15 and figure out my, what my minimum willingness to accept is for 15 units. So there's my supply. Price equals 10 plus 3Q. That's price is 10 plus 3, 15. So what's 3 times 15? 45. 45 plus 10. Price is 55. Okay. So now I can work out area of this rectangle. What's the area of this rectangle? Area of a rectangle, base times height. So, okay, base times height. I'm going to have a base of 15, a height of 80 minus 55. That's 25. So 15 times 25 gives me... 375. This triangle on the bottom then, what's that? One half, base of 15, height of 10 to 55. So height of 45. So 15 times 45 times 0.5 is gonna give me 337.5. Altogether, take the summation of my two parts here, and I have 375 plus 33.7.5, and I get a new producer surplus of 712.50. So producer surplus one, whoops. Producer surplus one is now 712.50. So, okay, what are we getting? We have our consumers, they're sad, they've lost. 400 down to 225. Producers, they're up, they're happy, they're winners in this case. What about society on whole? What has happened to society? Well, my social surplus is just those two added together. So 712.5 plus 225 is going to be 937.5. Uh, we see again all together with respect to my initial situation, I am altogether worse off. Society has lost. How much have we lost? Well, our dead weight loss, which is this guy right here, which we could calculate, right? It's a triangle, one half base times height. We would have a base of five, we would have a height of 25, or alternatively, it would be the difference between 937.5 and 1,000. That'd be how much society has lost due to this government intervention.
and we can calculate that in that fashion. So numerically how we can calculate this and numerically how we can work out our winners and losers. Next, let's go through the same example. Let's look at it for a price ceiling. So let's take a look at that next. Okay, so in this case here, we are looking at, instead of a price floor being imposed, we're gonna take a look at a price ceiling being imposed. We have the exact same market as we looked at in the previous case, so I'm gonna keep all the same numbers, right? We have the same initial surplus of 1,000, the initial price of 70, the initial coin exchange of 20, all of this. In this case, government comes along and they're gonna impose a price ceiling so, right, that is a maximum price. Price floor was a minimum price. Price ceiling is a maximum price. And we're going to impose a price ceiling of price ceiling of what's going to be a number that works here. We're going to impose a price ceiling of 40. So, okay, if we work through that, if that's 70, I don't know, maybe something like that is 40. Oh, let's make that a straight line. There we go. So this is my price ceiling, and that is at $40. Okay, at this point here then, what do we get? We have our quantity supplied. We have our quantity demanded. Just like in the last case, all I need to actually work about, unless I'm asking you how much excess demand there is, I just need to worry about my quantity exchanged. And again, how am I gonna find that? Well, in this case, I wanna know at a price of 40, what is my quantity supplied? So going to my supply equation, I wanna go, okay, at a price of 40, what is my quantity supplied? So price of 40, quantity supplied. Just took this equation, put in 40 for P. One unknown, we can do some algebraic voodoo and we can solve for that. So minus 10 from each side, what do we have? Minus 10, minus 10, that's going to give me 30 equals quantity supplied. Sorry, equals 3 times quantity supplied. Divide both sides by 3, 10 equals my quantity supplied. So there we go. We have my quantity exchanged, which is my quantity supplied underneath this price ceiling of 10 units. From here, we need to work out now our welfare analysis. And if we want to take a look at that, well, what do we have going on? What are we trying to calculate? Starting off with the producer, we have this triangle here as our producer surplus, right? So keep in mind, above their willingness to accept to the price they do accept. So tiny little triangle being received by our producers compared to rate this larger initial triangle that they were getting. Our consumers, what are they receiving? Well, if we drag up our quantity all the way up to our demand point, our producer, sorry, our consumer rather, our consumer surplus is below the demand, their willingness to pay to the amount of goods they actually buy all above this price ceiling. So we see that, okay, our consumer in this case is gonna get quite a large consumer surplus. All of this being reaped in their case. So producer surplus, consumer surplus, we have a good idea as to what's going on. We need to actually calculate this. So to start off, I'm gonna start with the producer surplus because it's just a triangle. This is gonna be easy to work out. So producer surplus one. What is that going to be? Well, one half base of 10, height of 10 to 40, that's 30. So that's going to give me a producer surplus. Let's actually write this this way so we can actually read it. One half, 10, 30. Let's just erase that guy. So one half, 10 times 30, that's going to be. 150. So we see, ooh, from a $600 surplus to a $150 surplus, our producers have really lost in this case. Our consumers then, 
Again, how do we find this weird shape? We can't. We need to decompose it into two shapes that we can work out. And those two shapes we can work out are if we cut over this black market price or my maximum willingness to pay rather. Let's make that a straight line. There we go. If we cut over that price, right, we're just carrying this 10 straight up. This would be my black market price. It would also be my maximum willingness to pay or my marginal benefit. If I work out this price here, I then have a triangle and a rectangle. So I can calculate each of those ones individually, add them together, and get my total consumer surplus. So let's work out this value to start. What I want to do, I have my quantity. I want to take that into my demand in order to get my maximum willingness to pay. So, okay, where's my demand? Price equals 110 minus 2Q. So, price equals 110 minus 2 times 10. Whoa. So, that's going to be 110 minus 20. 110 minus 20 is going to be 90. So I have my maximum willingness to pay, my marginal benefit, or if a black market formed, that would also be my black market price. From here, I can now work out my areas. So okay, area of this top guy here, what's that? One half, base of 10, times the height, 110 minus 90, 20. That's going to be 100 worth of surplus. This rectangle here, this is just base times height. Base of 10, height of 40 up to 90. So that's going to be 50. That's going to give me what? 500, meaning altogether, my consumer surplus after 5 plus 1 is going to be $600 worth of consumer surplus being earned. So, okay. Consumers, they win. Producers, they lose. What about society overall? What is our social surplus? Well, social surplus is going to be the consumers plus the producers. So 600 plus 150 is going to give me 750 altogether for society. So we see that society is a loser overall as well. Going from 1,000 down to 750. Again, our dead weight loss, that loss to society, that could be calculated as this triangle here, this part that we no longer receive due to that government intervention. And I can work that out quite easily with mental math. That's going to be 250, right? That difference between the social surplus earned before and after. So there we have it. We have their surplus analysis underneath a price ceiling. Saw the price floor, now the price ceiling. Okay, so those are our two price controls. Next one we want to take a look at is not necessarily a price control, but a quota system, also known as supply management. This is quite commonly used in Canadian dairy and a lot of Canadian agriculture, actually. Let's take a look at that. So underneath a quota, it's a little bit of a different situation. With a quota, instead of controlling the price, we are controlling the quantity produced. So let's take a look at a notional market here. We'll have price, we'll have quantity, we'll have our initial demand curve, demand, and we'll have our initial supply. In equilibrium, we're going to have our quantity exchanged and our market price. So there's my price, there's my quantity exchanged. Underneath the quota system, what's going to happen here is that the industry is going to get together, they're going to lobby the government to allow themselves to limit the production amongst their members. So, for example, within dairy farmers, they're going to get together, they're going to lobby the government to create a kind of dairy co-op. And amongst this dairy co-op, they're going to only allow their members to produce so many liters of milk every year, every month, depending on what time period they're looking at. And they give them tickets, right? They say, okay, here you go. Here's your tickets for how much dairy you can produce. If you exceed this, you get kicked out of the co-op or you get seriously fined. 
And hey, if you get kicked out, you can't sell anything because all dairy has to be sold through our co-op. That makes it problematic for you, right? To stay in business. So in this case here, what they do is they set an artificially low quantity. So we'll call that quantity quota. So they set a quota, a low amount of production that's below what that market efficient, what that quantity exchange would be. And then they say, okay, given that we have this quota, what price should we charge? Do we go up to our willingness to accept and charge this price? No, 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 we can do better. Do we go up to the market price? Well, no, we were making the market price before. They go all the way up to the maximum willingness to pay. Right up here, this is what the suckers are willing to pay, and this would be the price that they charge. So very similar to our black market situation. And we get the price under the quota being a higher price being charged in this scenario. So underneath the quota, we willfully hold back our production, right? Through some mechanism, we do this. We hold back our production willfully so. And by holding back our production, we're able to push up the price all the way up to the demand curve and charge people exactly what they'd be willing to pay for that quantity to be produced. In this way here, we can kind of maximize our revenues, get more revenue and earn more profit in this sense as well. What are the implications? Well, the implications of this, let's take a look. Starting off with our consumer surplus. Initially, we had this triangle here as consumer surplus, right? below our willingness to pay, above the price we do pay, giving us our consumer surplus. Under the quota though, our quantity exchanged falls to quantity quota, and our price that we pay rises to price under the quota. So our new consumer surplus becomes this area here. Consumer surplus. What about our producers? What happens to that? Well, our producers used to supply at the market, so all the way up to Q, below their price. So we'd get this area here as our initial producer surplus. Now, however, above their willingness to accept to their new quantity exchanged below their new quota price, we now get all of this here as our new producer surplus underneath the quota. So that would be my new producer surplus. Very similarly, right, as we saw in previous cases, social surplus is going to be the consumer plus the producer, and the result ultimately would be a lower social surplus with this bit here, again, once again, being my deadweight loss. So we have yet again another form that we can impose. This isn't a price control. This is more supply management, a quantity or production control in order to limit production in order to ensure a higher price. Under this, are we allocatively efficient? Well, no. No, we're not, right? And if we take a look at why that's the case, well, Q quota, this is our quantity exchanged. So if we carry this up, we get that guy there all the way across. We have our price. This is again off our demand or marginal benefit curve. So this is our marginal benefit. At our quantity exchange, the quantity quota, we have off of our supply curve, carry that guy across, we have our marginal cost. So marginal benefit does not equal marginal cost. That is ultimately we are not at equilibrium. So we are not allocatively efficient in this scenario either. Again, ultimately, anytime we have any intervention that pushes us from the equilibrium, we are no longer going to be allocatively efficient. Uh, that's kind of the big takeaway. Okay, let's take a look at the implication of this quota. Let's calculate welfare just like we did for price floors and price ceilings and work out the actual consumer producer social surplus. We'll use the same one that we had looked at in the previous cases there. Okay, so same supply, same demand as we had looked at before, giving us an equilibrium price of 70 and a quantity exchange of 20. 
We had already worked out the initial consumer, producer, and social surplus to be 400, 600, and 1,000 respectively. And in this case, let's suppose instead of a price control, the government allows, let's say, taxis to form a quota such that you can only perform taxi services if you have a taxi medallion. And as the taxi industry, you're going to lobby for these taxi medallions to be severely limited so that we cannot have, say, 20,000 taxi medallions available, but rather we're going to set our quota to be only 10, right? And we'll presume these are 10,000 taxi quotas, taxi medallions available, right? So Q would be in thousands. Semantics, right? It just, it's 10. That's fine. So, okay, what's going to happen? Well, underneath this quota, then, we're going to have our new quantity quota at 10, yielding us our price under the quota. So, okay, there we go. There's my quantity under the quota of 10. I will then have some price, which I will now charge, right? A much, much higher price because I've limited my output. How do I figure that out? Well, this is a quantity up to my demand. So I would want to calculate my marginal benefit or my maximum willingness to pay, right? That's what I want to take a look at. So demand price is 110 minus two times 10. That's going to be 110 minus 20. I'm going to have a price of 90 underneath this quota system. Great. From this price of 90 underneath this quota system, I can now begin to calculate my producer and my consumer surplus, starting off with the consumer surplus because, well, underneath my demand curve up to my new price, this is kind of the easiest one to calculate. Just a triangle. I can work this guy out. And what does that work out to be? Well, one half base of 10, height of 20. My new consumer surplus is going to be $100. So we see quite a drastic impact given this quota. Consumers are significantly worse off given this. So I'd have my updated consumer surplus. What about producers? Well, producers, my new producer surplus is going to be above my supply curve, up to my quantity exchanged, all the way below my willingness, or sorry, all the way below my new price quota. So this whole area here. Shade that all in. This here's all of my new producer surplus, right? I've stolen a whole bunch of it from consumers by engaging in this quota. And if I go and take a look at this, this is not a shape that I'm able to easily calculate. Problem. But no, no, it's not actually that big of a problem. And the reason being is that we can solve this by figuring out, hey, at a quantity of 10, Quantity of 10 up to my marginal cost or minimum willingness to accept, I can work out what that value is. So again, in this case here, I'm going to take my quantity under the quota and I'm going to put it into my supply function to get my marginal cost or my minimum willingness to accept. So let's do that. Here's my supply. So price is 10 plus 3q so price is 10 plus 3 times 10 price is 10 plus 30 price is 40 so okay there we go price of 40 i now have a triangle and a rectangle both relatively easy to calculate and i can work out my producer surplus that way so let's start off with this rectangle because that guy looks easy to do to start. So that's not my entire producer surplus. That's wrong to label it that way. This guy here, I can find that out as base times height. So a base of 10, height of 90 to 40. Well, that's 50. I get 500 for that rectangle. For the triangle then, 
one half base turn site, base of 10, height of 10 to 40, 30. So that there is going to give me 150. So, okay, in this case here, working that out, my producer surplus, 500 plus 150, is going to yield for me 650. And in this case, my producers are happier. They've made 50 in surplus, right? We've gone up. Yay, we're happy. What about society altogether? Social surplus. Well, we'll witness social surplus, summation of each of these. 750, we see that our social surplus has fallen, as is the case anytime we deviate from that maximum social surplus, that maximum social welfare at equilibrium, anytime we deviate from being allocatively efficient. So the impact of that. Okay, last kind of price control that we have to take a look at is going to be the implementation of a tax. So, so far we've taken a look at price floors, price ceilings, we've taken a look at quotas. The last one to look at is a tax. This is probably the most complex one and unfortunately maybe the one that we will end up utilizing the most as we carry on through the semester. So maybe take a break, maybe work through these first because the tax is very fundamentally different than what we've already seen. And then once you feel rejuvenated, restart and let's work through a tax scenario. So let's jump to that next. Okay, so let's take a look at a tax. Specifically, this isn't just like a tax. This is, right, a lot of times when you think about a tax, you think about your income tax. This is what we would call an excise tax, right? And this here is where it's, it's a consumption tax, right? All of a sudden, it starts to pay, it starts to charge you every time you want to buy something. And there's two different types of excise taxes we could take a look at. Let's take a look at these. Keep in mind, right, what we talked about, we already introduced this idea when we we're talking about our determinants of supply and demand. And we said that taxes, they are going to be kind of this augmentation of our supply curve. So that being said, let's just focus on our supply curve for a second here. So two types of tax. Our first type on the left, we're going to just be dealing with a per unit tax versus on the right is going to be a value added tax, VAT value added tax. Okay, let's start off with, well, let's start off with the value added tax because we're actually probably the most familiar with this one. A value added tax is a case where you just pay, say, 5% tax on everything that you buy. So if you were to buy, let's say, let's go something like this. You were to go here and let's say that that worked out to $10. Well, 10 and then you're paying 5% tax on that. You would actually pay in entirety Right, not, not a huge jump, you would pay an extra 50 cents. So that'd be something like that, right? Your actual price paid would be 1050. Meanwhile, if you went up and say you were all the way out here and you were buying, let's say, I don't know, that was $100 now at this point. Well, 5% on 100, that's gonna charge you an extra Something like that. 105, right? This is going to be $5 in tax. If we looked at this vertical distance, let's, uh, let's make it a different color. If we were to take a look at this vertical distance here, there we go, nice and thick and yellow. If we were to take a look at this vertical distance in each point, this was the size of the tax, how much we paid in tax. The value added tax, just 5%, so 50 cents when we paid 10 bucks, or $5 when we paid $100. And the impact that has on our supply curve would just be kind of a rotation of it. So, oh, it keeps snapping, but essentially it would just go through both of those points ideally 
And that gives us our supply plus our tax, such that that's a value added tax. The result is just a rotation of our supply curve. Our supply curve gets steeper. A per unit tax, right? This is, okay, to jump back, value added tax. Where have we seen this? This is, as we witness in Canada, GST, goods and service tax. Or in many provinces, we have GST plus PST, provincial sales tax, right? Both of these guys occur on almost everything we buy, and it's just a percentage of what we've purchased. A per unit tax, same kind of idea. This is kind of every time you go and buy a new computer, a TV, a fridge. There's usually a electronics levy, and this is just a fixed amount. You buy a more expensive computer, you buy a cheaper computer, it's the same amount per computer. That is, you pay a fixed tax per unit. And maybe that's something like you pay a $5 per unit tax. The result of that is if you go and you were to spend $10, right? So there we go. It's $10 really cheap computer. You would pay a $5 tax, bringing your price up to 15, right? This vertical distance, $5. You go do that, plus five. If you were to buy maybe more expensive, this would still be relatively cheap. Maybe my example of computer is not the best. If you were to go and buy a $100 computer, well then, same idea. You would still pay a $5 tax on that. It's not a value. It's not 5% of your purchase. It's just per unit, so it'd be 105 again. That is, in this case, all it has done, instead of rotating our supply curve, it has just augmented our supply curve such that, well, I kind of missed it a little bit there. Let's drag this guy down. There you go. It's augmented it. It's just given it a parallel shift such that we have our supply plus our tax. The theory behind each of these stays the same. In both cases, we could honestly evaluate either one as we move forward and the impact it has on our welfare analysis. Mathematically, though, I find that many students find this whole per unit tax easier to deal with, easier to visualize, easier to work out. So moving forward, this will be our focus. We will, for all intents and purposes, ignore this value added. We can just kind of say, okay, cool. We know that it's there. We know the theory applies to it just the same. We will focus on this per unit and the graphing and the analysis underneath that. Again, just for simplicity, just to make our lives easier. But this is the essence of a tax. So let's take a look what ends up happening. Well, let's take a look at, because this is a good that we often witness taxes on, let's witness a tax on gasoline right so tax on gasoline and so let's say that all of a sudden we have to pay an extra um plus five cents per liter and maybe this is something like a carbon tax right we have to pay an extra five cents per liter for a carbon tax how exactly does this work out for us well let's take a look to start off we have our price we have our quantity. We are going to have downward sloping our demand curve. And then upward sloping, we are going to have our supply. And we have, same as in every other case, our initial equilibrium. So our initial price and our initial quantity. The question is, this tax gets put on. We get charged five cents a liter. Who pays for this tax, right? Our big question that we're ultimately gonna be answering beyond our welfare analysis is we're gonna be asking who pays for this tax? And that is the consumer or the producer. 
knee-jerk reaction, many people instantly go, oh, clearly the consumer. We always end up paying for everything as the consumer. They put this on gasoline. The producer just passes it along to the consumer, and we now pay for it. Yeah, that, that seems to make sense. What we'll actually see, though, and we'll see this very soon, is that this tax is actually always paid by both. Paid by both. So really, when we're asking who pays for this tax, we're saying who's facing the tax incidence. That is, who is paying for most of this tax? Who faces the burden, the tax burden, the biggest part of it? And we'll evaluate how we can determine that shortly. First, let's just go through figuring out how we do this tax and how we go about it. So, okay, we have our supply curve. Let's augment it. So there's our current supply. We're augmenting it such that parallel shift upwards. This is our supply plus five. Oh, let's just go supply plus our tax. Where again, if we wanted to keep that in mind, as I was about to, this vertical distance there, vertical distance doesn't matter where I draw it, that was five cents per liter. That was the size of our tax. Okay, well, what happens? Our supply doesn't change, but our demand is still influenced by this augmentation. So what happens is the market now witnesses this new equilibrium here. And what we get is we have our new quantity under the tax and our new price under the tax. And here you go, see, Keith, look, I told you, consumer pays for it. All that happened is the price rose and the consumer is now paying for the tax. But, okay, okay, yes, the consumer is now paying this amount here. But keep in mind, these kind of taxes, they are collected by the firm on behalf of the government. So, this firm is collecting price tax, but they have to give back to the government five cents per liter. That means vertical distance between these two lines is five cents. They have to give that yellow little bit here back to the government, which means, hey, wait a minute. If they have to give that much back, they only get to keep this amount here, the price of the producer. So what we witness in this case here is that with respect to the original market price, the consumer ends up getting a little bit extra, right? They end up paying a little bit more, but the producer, they end up receiving a little bit less, such that this whole difference, if we took price tax minus, uh, sorry, price tax minus price producer, if we had numbers there, this difference that vertical distance between these two, vertical distance between these two would be five cents per liter, the size of the tax. And so in this way here, we see that the tax is shared between the two. Consumers pay more, producers receive less but the five cents is actually shared. What ends up happening to our surplus? Well, with respect to our surplus, we need to keep in mind that we have this original supply curve, right? Our original willingness to accept, not the augmented one. This is plus tax. We're dealing with our supply, our willingness to accept. So to start off with the producer surplus, we are receiving below the producer price, above my willingness to accept. So I'm getting all of this here as my producer's surplus. So, okay, producer surplus, red shaded area. What about my consumer? What is my consumer getting? Well, I don't have any shift or any augmentation on my demand curve, so it's just strictly below my demand below my maximum willingness to pay, above the price tax that I end up paying. So, okay, there we go. We have our 
consumer surplus. So consumer surplus, producer surplus, what's, what's left over? Well, what we've actually done in this case, we've actually introduced a third player. Our third player in this scenario is the government. And what the government is doing is they're collecting tax revenue, right? So in this case here, tax revenue, they're collecting this amount of tax per unit, right? This vertical distance over QT units. So altogether, we have this brown box here as our total tax revenue being earned. And believe it or not, from a social surplus, from like a total society surplus perspective, we would actually take this as a benefit because now this is tax money that the government's collecting and kind of the belief that the reason why the government's collecting this revenue is to redistribute back to society. Or by collecting it through this source, they don't have to collect it through income tax, right? So ultimately, we would say if we have government tax revenue coming into place, we would have consumer surplus, we would have tax revenue, we would have producer surplus, and then we would take the summation of all three of these, whatever values those are, to give us our social surplus. So if we have taxes being collected, they would pop in as one of our agents in our surplus category. End outcome, though, we'll witness with respect to our initial equilibrium level of output, such that right there, marginal benefit equals marginal cost. At quantity tax, we have a marginal cost there. We have a marginal benefit there. So, hey, they're no longer equal. We're no longer allocatively efficient. Being no longer allocatively efficient, we have a deadweight loss. And that deadweight loss is this triangle right here. And of course, deadweight loss to society. Okay, so that's our surplus analysis. We work through that. We see how it works out. A little bit more complicated because we have this tax revenue coming into play, but not, not increasingly bad, right? What about back to this initial question? Right, where we said who pays for this tax? We said, sure, it's paid by both, but who's paying the tax burden? Well, you look at this and you say, well, hey, Keith, it looks like it's fairly evenly split by both parties in this case. It looks like, right, if we were to find each of these boxes, let's see if I can shade them in separately. Uh, let's say this top box here, right, which I'm doing blue. This here is the tax part, which is being paid by the consumer, where this bottom one here is the tax being paid by the producer. These both look to be about the same shape, right? About the same size. So it seems like this five cents per liter is being split 50-50, evenly between the two parties. Yes, in this case, it roughly is. And yes, in this case here, that was done on purpose. But let's take a look at another example. Actually, let's take a look at two other examples. Let's take a look at these two different ones. So let's draw them side by side. We'll have in each one, we'll have price, we'll have quantity, and we'll have an identical demand. So we'll go like that. And just to kind of ensure that these are identical for both cases, this is the glory of working in a computer. Let's just copy and paste these guys. So there we go. We have two exact same demand curves in each one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna do relatively different supply curves. So in this case, I'm gonna do a relatively shallow supply. In this case here, I'm gonna do a significantly steeper supply. So I have my supply in each case. And then, so let's just label these supply supply, shallow, sensitive, relatively sensitive to the price or elastic, steep, relatively insensitive to the price or relatively inelastic. In both of these, I'm gonna go and impose an identical tax. So let's go 
something like this to attacks along those lines. Again, let's just make sure that this is the same. So copy paste. Let's just make sure we get parallel lines. There we go. Oh, that's the one I was looking for. Put that guy, something like that. And then we'll go one more. Okay. So now that's the size of our tax in each case. Let's augment these. So there's our augmented curve. I might need to change that. There we go. Lined up. That's my supply plus tax. Same vertical height here, right? We saw that. We just copied that from the other one. So, boom, there's my augmented supply curve. Supply plus tax. Okay, to start off, where was our initial price? Where was our initial quantity? So, to start off, there was my initial price. There was my initial quantity. Initial price, initial quantity, right? Oh, we'll just label these guys as well. P, Q, P, and Q. Okay. Now we have our tax. So again, our tax, we're going to go to our demand and augmented supply. And we're going to get our new quantity underneath the tax, our new quantity underneath the tax. So Q tax. Q tax, right? Everything doubling. This is taking longer to fill out. Underneath this, we're going to get our price under the tax, and we're going to get our price under the tax. So price tax, price tax. So, okay, what do we notice so far? We notice that in this left case here, in this left case, it appears as if our consumer is paying significantly more than in this right case. Right in this right case, eh, very, very little increase in the price of tax. In this left case, it's pretty drastic. But okay, this is just in relation to the initial equilibrium. Keep in mind, what we have is we have this vertical distance here. That is the size of our tax. So the firm collects PT, remits the difference, and then gets to keep the leftover for themselves. So, okay, we have our price producer there, and we see, oh, very, very little that the price producer gets in relation to the original price. So very small drop in their price. What about over here on the right? Well, they get their amount that they remit, so that vertical distance between the two supply curves, and then carry that across, we get the amount that they end up getting to keep after the remittance. Price producer, we witness that the producer in this case is paying significantly more. So, okay, left case, this kind of fell onto the consumer. Right case, it kind of fell onto the producer. The tax burden, right? Who paid for most of it? Always both, always both pay a portion, but we're asking who pays most. Okay, what's the difference? What's the difference between these two graphs that made that be? Right? And you'll probably look and you're like, well, okay, Keith, you drew one supply really shallow, the other one really steep. Clearly that's the difference. Yes, yes, it is getting at the difference. But it turns out what the actual determinant is here isn't about steepness or shallowness. The determinant as to who pays the burden of the tax comes down to the relationship between the elasticity of supply and the elasticity of demand. So it all comes back to these relative elasticities. And really what it comes back down to is that this relative elasticity, whoever is more inelastic, is going to be stuck paying the burden of the tax. That is, if you want to think about it, if we put in an inequality, whoever we point to we're pointing to the sucker who has to pay the tax. So, okay, up here. Elasticity of supply, elasticity of demand. We said, okay, the consumer is paying the tax. That must mean that the elasticity of demand is less than the elasticity of supply. We're pointing to the elasticity of demand, so the demand must be relatively inelastic, right? In this case, Elasticity of supply, 
elasticity of demand. Our producer is paying the burden, so we'll pay, point to the one paying the tax. And it must be that the elasticity of supply is relatively smaller. So in this case here, it's the relative elasticities between our supply and our demand curve that determine the tax burden. And right, we can just visually see this quite easily by which box is bigger, as we can see here. But it also comes down to ultimately the elasticities of each. And let's take a look at an example of this in order to actually work through this mathematically and actually be able to calculate it. So to do so, let's use the equation that we've been playing around with for the last little while. That is, we had a price of 110 minus 2Q and a price of 10 plus 3Q. We've already worked out this gave us an initial price of 70 and an initial quantity of 20. Okay, we then work through the initial consumer, producer, and social surpluses. And those worked out to be 400, 600, and $1,000 respectively. So, okay, we had the initial setup there. Taking a look at the graph itself, okay, we have price, we have quantity, we had our demand curve. Our demand curve was starting at 110 down to 55. We then had our supply curve, our supply curve started at 10 and was relatively steeper yielding our supply. Initial equilibrium, our initial equilibrium was at 70 and 20. Okay, so our initial market, we've already worked out our initial surplus to start off. Let's suppose that the government in this case imposes a tax of $10 per unit. So that is the vertical distance that this supply curve augments is 10, right? If we were to take this, we would have 10, 10 being the vertical distance in each case all the way along. That means including right here when you are at zero, meaning that we would have a new intercept point right there at 20 for our new curve. Parallel shift up, and we have our supply plus our tax. Okay, let's just zoom in a little bit on this because this is where our focus is gonna be for the next little while, and we'll work on this guy. So underneath this, we're gonna have our new quantity underneath the tax. We'll have to solve for this, right? We have the numbers, we can work this out. And we're gonna have our new price, which our consumer pays. Very similarly, we're gonna have our new price the producer receives. Super bonus points to answer what is gonna be this distance right here, this yellow line, this distance between the price tax and the price producer. Well, following along this distance between price tax and price producer, that is right back to what we've been getting at, this vertical distance between the two, that is our $10 per unit. That's the size of our tax, right? This vertical distance all the way along. So we have that. Okay, we have everything identified. We now need to calculate. First thing to calculate, first thing to calculate is gonna be my quantity underneath the tax. And how do we do that? Well, the way we do that is we set our demand function. Oh, didn't label that, that's sloppy. We set our demand function 
equal to our new augmented supply curve. Because keep in mind, right? Right there where those two are equal, that there is our new equilibrium, right? Our new equilibrium in the eyes of the consumer kind of idea. So, okay, let's go. Oh, we have our demand. Price equals 110 minus 2Q. But all we have is our original supply. We don't have our augmented supply. Seems to be a problem. But no, actually it's not. Keep in mind, this augmented supply is a parallel shift. So same slope. All that's changed is the intercept. So our new augmented supply is going to be 20 plus 3Q. Okay, that being the case, we can set these two equal to each other and solve. So price equals price, that is 110 minus 2Q equals 20 plus 3Q. Work through this, I don't like my negative, so let's add 2 to both sides. We have 110 equals 20 plus 5Q. Subtract 20 from both sides, we're going to get 90 equals 5Q. Divide 90 by 5, and that's going to yield for us 18 equals our new quantity. So let's update that. 18. From here, we need to now work out what our new price is, what the new price is underneath the tax. That's the price that the consumer pays. And to get that value there, well, we're going to put in our quantity tax into either our augmented supply, or our demand. Again, it shouldn't matter which one we use, whichever one we utilize, we're looking at the intersection of each one, we should get the same price. So let's use the demand there. Price is 110 minus two times 18. That should work out to 110, that should be, $74 as our new price under the tax. So let's write that guy down there. 74. Okay, the last thing we need to work out then is what the price that the producer pays is. And we can figure this out two ways. One's an easy way, one's a hard way. The more difficult way in this whole thing is we could say, okay, hey, look, here is quantity of 18 up to my supply curve. So I'll put 18 into my original supply and get the corresponding price that the producer pays. The other way, the relatively easier way to do it is to realize, hey, 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 we're paying $74 per unit. We have to remit to the government $10 per unit, meaning that the producer, they get to keep $64 per unit. 74 minus 10 is 64, right? 10 being the size of our tax. So relatively easier. We can work this out the other way too, right? We go back to that original supply. Price equals 10 plus 3 times 18. So 3 times 18 is 54. 10 plus 54, price equals 64. We get the same result, right? Good. Whew, we haven't made a mistake, right? Good way to double check our work at the least. Okay, if we want to take a look at now our tax incidents, who's paying what proportion? Well, we can go, let's just zoom in right here and take a look at that. What do we see here? Well, we see for our consumer, they used to be paying 70. They're now paying up here at 74. Well, our consumer is going plus $4. So, okay, they're paying $4 more. What about our producer? They used to receive $70 per unit. They're now receiving less. They are losing, how much? They're losing $6 per unit, right? They used to get 70, they're now getting 64. They have lost $6 per unit such that the amount gained, the amount lost altogether is our $10 per unit. Big thing, right, we see in this, 
our producer is paying the majority of this tax. Not a significant majority, but the tax burden definitely falls on them. Okay, that being the case, what did we say? We said that elasticity of supply, elasticity of demand, we would be pointing to who paid the burden. So, okay, in that case there, we're saying that the elasticity of supply should be less than the elasticity of demand. And let's work that out. Let's see if that's true. So, okay, let's, let's do that over to the right here. So start off elasticity of demand. Let's calculate that guy. We have two points. We have our price tax and we have our initial equilibrium. Okay. Elasticity of demand. Percent change in quantity demanded all over the percent change in price. The other way we could look at that was the change in quantity demanded all over the change in price times the average price all over the average quantity demanded. Or again, this guy here, that is one over our slope. That is our marginal effect. So, okay, if we go back to our demand equation, what was that? Our demand had a slope of two. So, okay, our demand had a slope of two. So that's gonna be one half times average price. So 70 to 74, right? Original price was 70, price tax is 74. So 70 plus 74 gives us 144 divided by two. We have an average price of 72. Average quantity demanded, what is that? Initial of 20, quantity tax of 18. Now oh, that one's easy, 19 altogether. So what does this give me? 0.5 times 72 over 19. I'm going to get an elasticity of demand of 1.89. Okay, again, interpreting this, what does that mean? Does this mean my demand is elastic, sensitive to price, or inelastic, not sensitive to price? Okay, what that there is, elasticity of demand greater than 1 elastic. I am sensitive to the price. That is saying for a 1% change in the price, I am witnessing a 1.89% change in my quantity demanded. Bigger change in quantity demanded than price, so I'm sensitive. Okay, what about my supply though? So for my supply, I'm going to be taking a look at my price producer and my original point, right? Both along my original supply curve. I'm not jumping between supply and supply augmented. So in that case there, between these two, elasticity of supply, percent change quantity supplied all over the percent change in price, or very similarly, change in quantity supplied, change in price, average price, average quantity supplied. I don't need the absolute value signs on this guy because it will always be positive given my law of supply. Again, that guy there, that is again my marginal effect, one over my slope and the way that I'm representing my functions. So for my slope in this case, that was one third. I had my slope of my supply curve of three. Okay, first bit, average price. In this case, I'm looking between 70 and 64. So we do 70 plus 64 divided by two. I get an average price of 67. Average quantity, oh, we've already done that, right? We only have the two numbers, that's easy, 19. Working this guy out then, what do we get? One third times 67 over 19, and I get 1.1. Seven five, so we'll go one point one eight. Okay, elasticity of supply is my supply curve sensitive, elastic, or not sensitive to price, inelastic. Again, elasticity over one means elastic. 
Again, it means that it's price sensitive. Not greatly so, but it is price sensitive. For a 1% change in price, I'm witnessing a 1.18% change in my quantity supplied. Okay, so going back, what did we say? We said the producer, the supplier is paying the burden. So that said, we said, hey, that should be that the elasticity of supply is less than the elasticity of demand. And what do we witness? We witness 1.18 less than 1.89. So sure enough, this appears to hold these relative elasticity is going to determine for us who, relatively speaking, is going to be paying the burden of the tax. Whoever has a lower elasticity is not as easily able to substitute away from this tax and is thus stuck paying the burden of it. But keep in mind, the overall tax is always split between both. We're just calculating the tax burden with those relative elasticities. Okay. Big way around all that, final bit to look at is actually calculating now our welfare analysis. Winners, losers, giving the implementation of this tax. Last thing for us to look at with this problem here. So let's take a look at how we do that. So first thing, let's just identify it, just like we did in the previous example. So for our producers, below our producer price, all the way over to our supply curve, our willingness to accept. Right, not the augmented one, but the actual supply. So shade all that in, this is going to be our producer surplus. So okay, if we work this guy out, it's just a triangle, right? We don't have to do anything funny with it. That's just one half base times height. Base of 18, height of 10 minus 64. So 18 and 54. So what does that work out to? 0.5 times 18 times 54 gives me a producer surplus of 486. So okay, producers, they've, they've lost. What about my consumers? Uh, let's keep that in line with the colors we're using. What about my consumers? Okay, for our consumers, same kind of idea. Below our willingness to pay, above the price tax, which we do pay, and we get all together here, our consumer surplus. So again, just one half base, I have a base of 18 still. And in this case, my height, 74 to 110. Uh, what is that? 110 minus 74 gives me 36. So 0.5 times 18 times 36 is going to give me 324. Okay. Common mistake. We say, great, we have our consumer surplus. We have our producer surplus. We add those two together. We get our social surplus. No, don't do that. What we still have is we now have our tax revenue, right? So tax revenue. Our tax revenue is our tax per unit. So in this case here, what do we have? $10 per unit over 18 units. So we get this box here. This is my tax revenue, so base times height, base of 18 times a height of 10. So that's going to be 180. Now, now I can take the summation of all this to get my total surplus, right? My social surplus. So we would have 180 plus 486 plus 324, and I get all together my social surplus of 990. So still loss, right? We still have our deadweight loss here, this lost surplus that nobody was able to get right there, but 
we've been able to capture some tax revenue, ideally revenue that can be then redistributed back to society. So excise tax, one of the most complicated, convoluted price controls we can put in in this chapter. We have three parties going on. We have consumers, we have producers, we have government tax revenue. And then we have this whole tax burden. Who's paying most of it, right? Both always pay part, but who pays most of it comes back to elasticities. So we have that whole elasticity chapter coming back to haunt us. So a lot going on here, a lot of possible questions coming out of this. Personally, this is a big part that I enjoy. There's a lot of interesting things we can do with this as we move on into the course. So if you were to pick one aspect of price controls to really study, one aspect to be like, wow, I should know this inside and out and be comfortable with it, this would be the one, right? You'll still likely see questions from the others, definitely, but this will be the big one that will follow us through the course. So yes, it's the hardest. Yes, there's the most going on with it. It's the one you're going to want to be able to work through confidently, though. So make sure you're able to do that. Make sure you spend lots of practice on it. That does us for our price controls. We've wrapped into this our surplus, our welfare analysis, and we've brought into this again our market and our equilibrium. If you have any questions on any of these three topics, the market, surplus welfare analysis, allocative efficiency, price controls, feel free to drop me a line either by email or through the D2L discussion boards. That does us for this week.